Good evening, everyone. My name is Nick Fluck, and I'm the president of the Law Society. This evening, we're going to be discussing the Lord Chancellor's recent announcement on criminal legal aid. We know that the changes will profoundly impact you, and we repeatedly made those impacts clear to the Lord Chancellor. Sadly, the Lord Chancellor was only prepared to make a few amendments. The main focus of this event this evening is for us to answer your questions and to ensure that you're as informed as anyone can be at this early stage with what the announcements contain. The presentation you're about to see is to give you an overview of the announcement alongside our initial response. Tonight, you're going to hear first from Des Hudson, our Chief Executive, and then from our Head of Legal Aid, Richard Miller. Following the presentation, we'll open the floor to your questions. Lastly, you will have noticed that we'll be videoing tonight's presentation so it can be uploaded onto our website. And on that note, I'll hand you over to the Chief Executive. Well, uh, good evening, everybody, and let me uh, add uh, my uh, welcome in these most difficult of circumstances to those of the President. Um, over the course of the next uh, 20 minutes or so, what uh, we're going to seek to do is to give you an overview of where we currently are. We're going to be inevitably looking, I think, at the headlines of the decisions. We're going to try and lay out what we're planning to do next. Um, Richard is going to go through what details we currently have of the announcements, what's changed between the last time uh, you may have seen this stuff or when the last consultation process started in September, and we'll give you what information we best have and our best estimate of the timetable uh, that the uh, MOJ and the Legal Aid Agency are going to be working to, and then we'll have time for questions. Um, so as you know, last Thursday, the 27th, the uh, Lord Chancellor announced his decision in respect of the second consultation which uh, he uh, uh, commenced back in September of 2013. Now as you know, we have sought throughout this process, going back to April of 2013, to oppose the cuts. We believe that the cuts and the other fundamentals of these changes are at odds with the evidence that we and others have filed in response to both consultations. And we have sought to make that clear at every opportunity. We do not resile from any of the arguments or any of the evidence that we have made in that regard. You may also be aware that uh, we've commissioned evidence throughout this process from Deloitte and from uh, Andrew Otterburn, and most recently, uh, we commissioned a report from Oxford Economics, which I hope you've seen and which, uh, in our view, advanced the argument that if he did nothing at all, the Lord Chancellor would have made savings in his target year of 2018-19 of at least £84 million, simply because of the decade-long fall in the volume of criminal cases. So what we have sought to do throughout this process is to oppose, but to impose with engagement. We have, over the last few weeks, when the Lord Chancellor's timetable became clearer, we have sought to consult widely with the uh, profession about this last series of issues and potential changes. We've met with every single specialist practitioner group representing or involved in the representation of the criminal defence practitioners. We sought meetings with every local law society in the country to better inform our deliberations and our concerns. And what they said by a significant, significant majority that they wanted the law society to continue to engage to make the best of a dire, dire situation. And so, for example, we've been trying to maximise the number of firms who would be able to participate in the duty uh, contract at market, as well as seeking to ease transition to the new arrangements. <coughs> but let me repeat, we are not in any doubt that the supplier base, to use the jargon, is fragile, and cannot easily or readily sustain the level of cuts decided upon by the Lord Chancellor. We are in no doubt that our proposition, published many months ago for a single-tier contract based around quality, was the preferred approach. But what I think is also 
sadly clear is that the Lord Chancellor has been determined to make the savings and to make those savings via cuts. His budget, he would say, has been set by the coalition government and in the approach he has adopted, we have concluded that he is politically secure. And let me give you a couple of examples as to why we reached that conclusion. You may know that a few weeks ago, Simon Hughes joined the uh, ministerial team at the Ministry of Justice, replacing uh, Lord McNally. Our president sought a meeting with him, met about three, four weeks ago now. And it became clear to us that either Simon Hughes does not have the power, nor the desire, or possibly the mandate to challenge the fundamentals of what were then the Lord Chancellor's proposals. And as a result of that, we concluded that these propositions would clear the coalition approval process whereby changes such as this have to be signed off by the Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg's office and by a, a senior Conservative uh, politician. We also take the view that the Lord Chancellor is secure politically in his approach because he does not need to submit any of his propositions for change to a vote in the House of Commons. Nothing needs to be passed by the House of Commons to allow the cuts and the changes he announced last Thursday to come into effect. Now, the MOJ would argue that they have sought to mitigate the risks around these changes. Uh, and they would point to the transitional package uh, that they uh, have agreed to. And I think that uh, Richard Miller will talk about that in a little bit more detail shortly. But our sense in terms of the big issues here is this, that the risk that they, need, they seek to mitigate need to be measured against the scale of challenge identified in the KPMG report. And I hope if you've not had the opportunity to do so, you'll go to the MOJ website and you'll check out the KPMG report for the contracting area that you may be interested in or need to consider making a bid in. Lots of questions remain about what is now being termed the implementation phase, and I can assure you that we have already started pressing for answers and more information uh, around uh, that uh, implementation phase. Now, just to confirm some specific details, he is making cuts totaling 17.5% in two tranches, the first of which is likely to be later this month. He simply needs to table changes to the regulations. And there will be a second tranche of 8.75, likely to be in May 2015, when the, uh, that's the date for changes to the duty contracts are likely to come into effect. In terms of own client contracts, which will have a four-year life, there will be an unlimited number of those contracts for those firms who meet the quality criteria. But the Lord Chancellor has decided that he will limit, he will ration the number of duty contracts. The KPMG report identifies a range of contracts that he can award, if you will, direct awards to individual bidding entities. And that range is 325 at its lowest to 525 at its highest. Uh, it is of no doubt to us at all that the ministerial advice that has been given by civil servants, by the legal aid agency, has been that if you expect the supplier base to withstand these cuts, what you must do is give them scale. So ration the number of contracts. Have no truck with informal consortia go nearer to 325 than to 525. Well, such comfort as it is, the Lord Chancellor is going to award 525 contracts and he will accept duty contract bids from informal consortia that can involve up to four firms. And we anticipate, therefore, that potentially up to 800 firms could participate in that market. We're also clear what that means in terms of the number of existing firms who will not be able to participate in that market. In terms of revised fee structures, they're going to be broadly uh, as proposed in September. There are some changes which Richard will speak about in a little bit more detail. 
Now, turning to um, some of the uh, headlines around the uh, transitional support package that the MOJ uh, have, in, have announced, uh, they are, I think, via the legal aid agency, going to be offering consultancy advice to firms in relation to business planning issues, IT issues, and around other structural arrangements. We're going to be uh, seeking to work with uh, the legal aid agency and in terms of our own plans to offer all reasonable practical support we can to our member firms in terms of planning, of understanding the bidding process, evaluating the options. We hope, for example, to publish shortly in a matter of weeks a, a model agreement about how informal consortia might work. We're currently working with Deloitte and Irwin Mitchell on putting that uh, package uh, uh, together. There are also going to be um, tailored packages, as the Ministry has described them, uh, through which um, uh, individual solicitors' firms can apply to the British Business Bank to take advantage of what's called the Enterprise Finance Guarantee, uh, so that there will be a source of finance available to firms who choose to make a uh, bid via the uh, business, uh, uh, via Biz, uh, which is going to be run by the British uh, Business Bank, which will carry guarantees from the government. A legal aid efficiency group is to be established. Uh, there are going to be representatives from the society, from the Bar Council, as well as from the MOJ and the Legal Aid Agency. And there is a commitment uh, to seek out improvements and process changes that will help practitioners. There will also be uh, a review led by Sir Brian Leveson on part of the uh, Lord Chief Justice to look at the criminal procedure rules, and we will be involved in that. And there is a lot of work to do, because if you look at one of Leveson's early changes in relation to criminal procedure rules, uh, about, for example, the timing of guilty pleas before legal aid has been confirmed, that there is potential uh, for issues, problems, if you will. There is also potential through that process to aid uh, practitioners. There are also steps going to be taken to improve uh, uh, cash flow for uh, practitioner firms. And we're also uh, told that the government has decided that it will reinstate payments directly to the practitioner firm in relation to crack trials in the Crown Court where the prosecution offers no evidence on all counts. Now, it seems to us that there is much, much more still to be done. We need to press, as I've already uh, uh, said, for more information, more clarity. There will be, I think, big issues around the timetable and the bidding process itself. What is clear from all of the consultation we've recently completed, uh, that um, all of the practitioner groups, the local law societies, by a very significant majority, want us to continue to engage to seek further concessions and changes from the government to provide the best possible outcome in what is a very serious, serious position. We're going to hold the government to its commitments uh, to support legal firms. We're going to hold them to their commitments to ensure that they monitor from the start the impact of these changes. And you may also have noted that there is a commitment from the government to commission and publish an impact review of those changes, although that is not going to be before 2015. We'll be seeking a, a further round of urgent consultations with local law societies, with each and every practitioner group to better inform our own thinking in terms of what the issues are, to understand what practitioners and firms, uh, practitioner groups and local law societies consider uh, to be the big issues. And we're going to seek to bring together a package of support from the society to help all firms with whatever choice they make in relation to the bidding process or other choices that may need to be faced. We're going to be holding uh, road charges and webinars. Uh, we'll be making that consortia guidance available that I've also uh, referred to. And we'll continue to make sure that we feed through all the advice and practical support that we can. And I've mentioned already Sir Brian Leveson's um, uh, review. Now, all of that means I think that our sense of what is happening, what the rules are, is going to develop and change over the coming weeks. We'll be looking to make sure that that is available. There is a special site on the Law Society's website specific 
to criminal um, legal aid and you can access that um, very easily if you're not yet using that information source and I'd urge you to, uh, uh, to consider that. So I think Richard I'm going to pass to you now to go through the details of these announcements. Thank you, Des. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard Miller. I'm the head of the legal aid team here at the Law Society, and I have been since 2007, which means I lived through this in 2008 to 9, when the ministry was last trying to implement uh, massive change to their criminal procurement methods. And I well remember the long period from when they announced the policy decision to when they finally gave up on trying to implement it and the number of important discussions that we had between those two points. A lot can change between the announcement of a high-level policy and its implementation at grassroots level. I wanted to start by just going through a few more of the details of the government's announcement last week. They will be offering 525 duty contracts and these contracts will be of different sizes in different procurement areas. The analysis that the government has done looks at each area independently, looks at the number of firms already operating there and the level of consolidation and growth that they believe firms are capable of achieving in order to determine what size contracts they can offer. So that has led to very different answers in different parts of the country. And what we've seen is because of the approach they've taken in London, where there are now 32 procurement areas instead of the nine originally, the average size of the contracts on offer is going to be only £270,000. So very much lower than we had been expecting from the September consultation. Outside London, the average contract size is £400,000. But this varies very significantly and in some of the urban areas outside London the contracts are quite a bit higher than that and in the rural areas they are very much lower. So there are now the 32 procurement areas in London, there are 53 outside London but broadly speaking they have not changed their approach to procurement areas outside London and they are still requiring firms to provide services covering the whole of the procurement areas. Another new little uh, twist that the government has decided on is that they will not allow firms to terminate these contracts on a no-fault basis. So if you do bid for one of these four-year duty solicitor contracts, you are legally binding yourself to remain within that contract for four years. So if you were thinking you might give it a go for a couple of years and if it didn't work you'd get out, the government is not going to give you the right to do that. You will be committed for the full four-year period. The Lord Chancellor will retain to himself the right to terminate these contracts without fault, but this time, for the first time ever, that will be subject to the payment of compensation to firms if the Lord Chancellor exercises that right. That's something we said very early on, that it was completely unacceptable to have a right to terminate without compensation, and at long last, that at least is being addressed. And there will be a requirement in the contract for firms to pass a peer review during the life of the contract. So that's not something you'll have to achieve before you get to the contract in the first place. That is something that will be during the life of the contract. You would have to achieve that. Looking at uh, some more detail of the announcements, there will be a single national fixed fee for police station cases, but there will be a higher weighted fee in London. So it's not going to be that same single fee that you saw in September. There will be simplified payment schemes in the Magistrates Court and the Crown Court, but there will be higher fees for not guilty pleas, as we've been arguing for since September. We know that was one of the things that the profession told us was of grave concern, the idea of flat fees, whether it was a guilty or a not guilty plea, and we are very glad that the uh, Lord Chancellor did at least give way on that point. And there will be some new staged payments for litigators and advocates. The staged payments for litigators will come in at two points. Uh, later this year, there will be a payment stage on the first day of a trial that's listed for more than 10 days. 
And from next year, there will also be a payment, this is in the Crown Court, uh, there will be a payment on an effective PCMH hearing. There will be a stage payment that you would be entitled to in every case once there has been an effective PCMH. And as Des mentioned, the government has now restored the proper payment for cracked trials in either way cases where the prosecution offers no evidence. When they brought it in that cut a couple of years ago, we objected strenuously to the fact that in a case where you have actually proved that you were right and the prosecution has thrown in the towel, that you were penalised as a result. We always said that was utterly wrong. And again, that is one small measure that uh, we could be pleased has uh, arisen out of this, that the Minister has agreed to restore the proper payments in those cases. I just wanted to run through some of the things that have changed since the original proposals in April. So back in April last year, what we were faced with was a single contract. There would be no client choice, there would be no separate contracts for prison law, and what we now have is we've got the duty contracts, we've got the own client contracts, client choice is being retained, and we have separate contracts for prison law. Back in April, there were 400 contracts on offer. And if you didn't get one of those 400 contracts, that was it. You were out of this market. What we have now is the 525 duty solicitor contracts plus an unlimited number of own client contracts. And apparently there are around 200 firms that undertake criminal legal aid work that do not do duty work. So of the 1,600 firms in the market, there's 200 there already who won't be competing with you for the duty contracts and who will be able to carry on exactly as they are at the moment. And plus, in addition to that, the Ministry has now agreed that firms would be able to bid as consortia and uh, we think particularly in some of the rural areas that will be uh, pretty much the only way to construct a bid and that will ensure that there is a higher number of firms in those areas that remain in the market. We now have these 85 procurement areas instead of the 42 at the outset, which we said at the time we felt were too large and were going to cause significant problems. The bidding process will be on the basis of capacity and capability instead of being on price, as the Ministry originally proposed. And as we've seen, the fee cuts will be 8.75% now and a further 8.75% in June next year instead of the 17.5% plus whatever else you knocked off your bid that was going to come in from autumn this year in the original proposals. And just to give a little more detail on the fee structure changes, in September we were faced with a single national fixed fee for police station work with no escape. What we now have is there will be national fixed fees but with a higher fee in London and the escape mechanism has been restored. For the Magistrates Court, what the uh, Ministry is now proposing, instead of the single fee for Magistrates Court work that was proposed in September, we will see the lower and higher standard fees will be combined into a single fee, but the different fee structures um, for guilty and for not guilty pleas will be retained, and the escape mechanism is also being retained. In the Crown Court, we have a slightly simplified, simplified structure, but it will retain the pages of prosecution evidence, the offence type and the case type, whether it's a guilty plea, a cracked trial or a full trial, those will still be retained as the factors which determine the fee in those cases. Now the government is proposing that the first fee cut will come in during March 2014. That will be for cases starting after that date. For any case that's already ongoing, you will receive payment at the current rates. The tender for the own client contracts is due to open in April 2014. That will be a single stage process in which you have to demonstrate that you meet the initial pre-qualification questionnaire requirements, which is primarily that you've paid all your taxes and you've not been found guilty of bribery. And they will also ask questions in there that ensure that you meet the minimum requirements of the contracts. And provided you do meet those criteria, you will be allocated your own client contract by around June of this year. And that's the point at which the Ministry will then open the tender for the duty contracts. 
And our understanding of this, although there's a lot more detail that we are still waiting for from them, is that firms will be asked to submit their applications and their delivery plans at that stage. And the Ministry will then assess them and score them and will announce its decisions in February 2015 with a view to implementing the new contracts from June 2015. Now, having read this timetable, my view is that, well, to say it's challenging would be something of an understatement. I would find it very difficult to see how the Ministry is going to keep to this time frame. There is still a lot of work to be done on developing the procurement processes. We haven't yet seen the draft contract. We know that there are likely to be a very substantial number of tenders submitted that they will then have to assess. And the idea that there will be only four months from the contracts being allocated to firms being able to actually gear up to start on the new contracts strikes us as a really very short time indeed. The difficulty in terms of seeing any extension of the timetable is the existing contracts are scheduled to expire in July next year. But I just find it very difficult to see how the Ministry is going to achieve all of this within that time frame and something somewhere may have to give. And I think we're going to need to be keeping up the pressure on the Ministry to say why we think this timetable is just too tough for firms to be able to achieve to try and persuade them to take a more realistic approach to that. We have a number of continuing questions. These are just a few of the ones that have already occurred to us over the weekend reading the uh, response from the government. How will the procurement processes work, particularly in London, where a lot of the initial ideas about having a team that will deliver the contract that they will assess, that doesn't work in London when you've got 32 areas. You can't have an office in every area. You can't have a team that's dedicated to each individual contract. There's an awful lot about the approach that the Ministry was thinking about that just isn't going to work on that basis. So there are a lot of challenging questions about the procurement process that the Ministry still needs to answer. What will the terms of the new contract be? We are expecting the Ministry to start consulting with us on the contract terms within the next three or four weeks. And this is somewhere where I would very much value your assistance because the terms of the contract do determine the extent of the bureaucracy that you're working under. So any ideas you have of things that you would like me to press for in terms of removing some of that bureaucracy from the contract, I would be very pleased to get that sort of feedback so that we can push for as much simplification and reduction of bureaucracy as possible. How will police station agencies be affected? The Ministry has been thinking in terms of allowing firms to instruct agents but saying those agents would have to have at least an own client contract. But the police station agencies, broadly speaking, won't have an own client contract. So how will those organisations stay in business? How will you continue to be able to make use of that resource if you do so at the moment? That's something we need an answer on. We don't yet know what are the key performance indicators the Ministry will be imposing in these contracts. And we need to know what are the things that they are going to be looking at most closely where you're going to have to make sure that you get things right and that you're in compliance. And we don't yet know how the duty slots are going to be allocated. Yes, we know that the Ministry is intending to allocate equal-sized contracts to all their winning bidders, but if you get all the Tuesday night slots and your rival gets all the Friday night slots, you're not going to be particularly happy. So we need to know how they are going to ensure a fair allocation of the duty slots now that they're no longer going to be doing it on the basis of duty solicitors, but are going to be doing it on the basis of firms with equal allocation. So a lot of questions we've already identified that we need answers to. We've got no doubt there's plenty more. And again, the feedback from you will help us to identify what the questions are that we need to be pressing on the Ministry.